Morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, conversation with, by National Law University Delhi and Caravan Magazine on the quagmire of uh, judicial appointments. Uh, uh, of course, uh, we have a wonderful panel with us, and I'd like to thank all of them for accepting our invitation at extremely short notice. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for taking the time out to come today. Um, also, I'd like to uh, thank the Vice Chancellor, Professor Ranbir Singh, for supporting this event, and also Caravan, uh, especially Hathor Singh Bal and Munaza at Caravan for uh, helping us with this and ensuring that all of you are here. Um, uh, of course, we are gathered here today in the context of uh, the judgment of the Constitution Bench uh, on judicial appointments. Uh, of course, there's been a lot that has been written and a lot that has been said, uh, and we hope we can clear some of the clutter around many of the issues, uh, both constitutional and political ramifications, uh, its consequences on democratic governance uh, and uh, allied issues. And uh, uh, and, and I'm sure that, um, uh, I'm sure all of you have, will have lots of questions and we've tried to ensure that uh, there is disagreement on the panel as well. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, um, uh, Ms. Kamini Jaiswal could not join us. Uh, she's taken very ill, and uh, uh, otherwise it was supposed to be 2-2, uh, but uh, I think now uh, we will have uh, Ms. Ramchandran and Ms. Devan uh, opposing, I mean sort of, I guess, disagreeing, disagreeing with the judgment, and uh, uh, Professor Bakshi will lead the charge on uh, defending the judgment, I suppose. Uh, and I will join ranks now with uh, Professor Bakshi on that, and so that we can even things out a little bit. Um, and uh, a whole range of issues in terms of uh, what uh, the second judge's case decided uh, is primacy uh, a basic feature of the Constitution? Uh, is primacy the only way to ensure uh, independence of the judiciary? Uh, and uh, and what happens, and importantly, uh, questions around the basic structure itself. And I'm sure uh, uh, Mr. Ramchandran will address that, and he's written about it, uh, about uh, uh, why we must be skeptical of the doctrine itself. And I, uh, and I wonder if uh, the judgment gives reason enough uh, to doubt the doctrine once more. Uh, and I'm sure a wide, a wide range of issues uh, will be debated today. Uh, the format is um, we'll have each of the three panelists uh, speak for uh, 15 to 20 minutes, uh, and then uh, we'll have a conversation amongst ourselves for about uh, 30 minutes, and we'll then open the floor uh, for questions for about 40 minutes. So that's going to be the format. Uh, if I may first invite uh, Professor Bakshi to give his opening remarks. Thank you very much. Vice Chancellor, Professor Pandey, distinguished faculty and students, distinguished co panelists, and um, yeah, there's a warm up time. Come here, Mr. Ramnathan, you're sitting far off. There's plenty of space. There's the seats here. You, you can still exit whenever you like. <laughs> uh, and I uh, know, I'm very pleased, I didn't know about this center for whatever, <laughs> public law. I uh, congratulate you on uh, organizing this debate, but I'm sure you will other events. I'm very happy that it's the center. Normally, national law schools have uh, uh, more centers than the faculty. I don't know if <laughs> uh, in your case, but certainly there are fraudulent centers, and there are not so fraudulent centers. And I hope you are like one. Anyway, make it right by being here. Um, hereby. Uh, very good. Now, I, uh, I don't know how many of you would have read the judgment. I only 14, 15 minutes. I try to be, I can't read what I've written because I write very badly if you can see this. Uh, therefore, I'll enlib uh, more or less. Uh, I hope uh, that most of, the, most of people here have our uh, law students, uh, our lawyers, and therefore have. Uh, presumably read the head notes, if not the judgment. I'd urge you to read the judgment before, without it, it makes no sense. And uh, we are two at two. I don't know whether, uh, initially I was only in the position of Justice Chalmeshwar. 
who dissented in four to one judgment. But now I've got a distinguished note with me, so uh, two to two, and you will be the judge of judges. And that's the first thing I have to say, that judging the judges is an awfully difficult task. And don't you believe, just because you happen to be a professor, a student in law school, or happen to be a distinguished lawyer like the two, or many others, or you published a few treatises in treatises on law, that you are able to judge the judges. Socially responsible criticism, SRC, of judges is very rare and very difficult. Uh, and I can speak with an experience of my entire life before me, although I'm quite young, but never you um, I've encouraged my students to undertake SRC, but I have practically failed. Most criticisms you hear of any judgment are partisan. They are not, they don't appreciate the internal convention of the judges. They don't appreciate the constraints on judging. They don't read the arguments presented before the judges. They simply look at some part of the judgment or even without looking at any part of the judgment to make up their mind. That is not socially responsible criticism. So I hope you will read the entire judgment carefully as I have read already three times over. And I made a mistake because I can't write very well uh, after this talk here. Uh, and I made a mistake. I attributed to Joseph Kurian, Justice Joseph Kurian, a statement that was made actually by Mother Lopo about uh, about eminent persons. I correct it now in my paper. But uh, they, are that, they just showed you must read the judgment very, very carefully before you open your mouth to criticize the judges. The judges themselves study a lot more in order to give a judgment. And their judgment stands for all times to come. And therefore, and it is public document, it's not classified. And therefore, it's a serious business. My, now my time begins. The first uh, first let us see let's survey the criticisms made of the present case. So I'm there I'm talking with two distinguished people here. Justice Chalmeshwar is right in saying his dissenting opinion, a solitary dissenting opinion, that the entire world, as it were, was waiting for this judgment as to what the judges wanted to do. And let us take it as a good starting point, that we're all watching for it. And it's come. And it's gone. It's no longer news. They're discussing it too late. The government apparently has accepted this. And today the hearing began on the collision system. So it has come and gone. And we are meeting to still evaluate. Scholars always speak after judges speak. And they can take, pick and choose their time to speak. They can speak up two years, three years, four years, five years, or not, not at all. So we are very eclectic people. But I'm glad for this discussion. It is still contemporary, it matters to people. Justice, um, who was it? He said in the world of the judges' cases, uh, personally, personally said in the second, the first judges' case, which I'm glad some of the judges have noticed, particularly Chalveshwar, Brother Chalveshwar has noticed it, and quoted from him, but has been with me for a long time. And he essentially said that this is a fancy creature, independent of judiciary, for the lawyers and judges. This doctrine is not a doctrine which people of India care about. What people of India care about is speedy justice, efficient justice. They are not concerned with how judges are appointed or whether judges are independent or not. Now, the only bar of this Fazwali doctrine long time ago was Chalmeshwar, Brother Chal Justice Chalmeshwar. Um, and four of the judges did not agree. 
Now, what are the criticisms? One of the main criticisms is, um, uh, and these people have studied it, but uh, there are many people who speak with us today, or they agree how well. The unstudied people criticize the judgment on the ground that it breaches parliamentary sovereignty. And there is no such thing as sovereignty under the Indian Constitution. That's a fact of life. We, now, we are celebrating 70th year of something very short. The Constitution provides only for supremacy within the appointed sphere. Parliament is supreme in its own sphere. So it's judiciary, so it's actually. There is no any organ which is supreme, sovereign. Only the people of India are sovereign. Therefore, this criticism entirely misappro misappropriates the idea of constitution. This is not the idea of constitution. If Herbert <coughs> Lionel Adolphus, as in a heart, was more literate, he would have a footnote to Indian decisions. Because in this sense, 1951, Supreme Court says, in, in the very Laws Act case, advisory opinion, first advisory opinion, 1951, it says precisely what I'm saying, that no power under the Constitution is sovereign. And the people are sovereign, just as Dr. Gatka in uh, Union of India versus uh, in Cole says, people of India are sovereign. Justice Bhaktarama in second judge's case says there are two kinds of judges, people's judges and judges' judges. Those appointed by the judges and beholden to them and people's judges, those appointed ultimately by the people. And he thinks president represents people, so he thinks president now therefore. Uh, in the present situation, president does represent people, I think so, to make a non-political comment. So, in a sense, the president, uh, what, uh, yeah. so in a sense, everybody is supreme within the appointed sphere, and no one sphere is sovereign. That is the first point. Therefore, that's a facetious criticism to say, uh, our, our constitution makes a distinction between constituted power and constituent power. And very simply, the distinction is this, that constitute power, constitute power shall act within its own sphere. And constitute power, the power to change the constitution itself, which lies with the people. Although our constitution does not provide for referendum. That's a larger area, I will not go into it. But forget sovereignty. That's a stupid criticism. That has nothing to do with the constitution that now exists or has existed for the last 70 years. It may be your wish list that somebody should be sovereign. That's, I'm not concerned with your wish list. That's just as you are not concerned with my wish list. The second thing is, very quickly, uh, the second thing is, um, that if you look at now, I know Rajiv does not believe in uh, basic structure. Good luck to him. And he argues very passionately that should not be basic. Good luck to him. But there is the basic structure. Supreme Court has laid down the law. It has been there for uh, whether Rajiv likes it or not, take the law of the land. And after Keshanda, there have been several decisions which have been diagnosed in the other case, the, other case. the Bombay explicated, you all know. Um, but the deep argument about basic structure is what is an upset, what basic structure contains and what does not contain. And whether independence of judiciary is a part of the basic structure. Independence of judiciary is a part of basic structure. So has said the government, successive governments of India, successive jurists, successive lawyers, before the court, outside the court. The only question is the NJAC violated. Both the amendment, constitutional amendment, 99th amendment, then, and the law. And the act. I'll come to it after a part of time. So, that is the basis of existence. And why is it existence? Some people say um, 
democracy is a funny discussion going on in the public. Some features are more superior than others. So democracy is more important than uh, independent judiciary. Where do you get this from? First of all, you argue this way because there is a basic structure. And then you come into a box and, you know, and then you argue which is what. A complete nonsense. <laughs> all basic structures, I like, listen, listen, I, like, I withdraw the word nonsense because there's a patent pending. That is Justice Kaju. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how any of his words are. So I withdraw that word. That is non hyphen sense. That doesn't make sense. Uh, I, I call Kaju jurisprudence the Cashew Nut jurisprudence. I've written on it. That's different. But, uh, interestingly, sending me now is the articles. All of a sudden, I, you are also a recipient of that by email. Very interesting. Very interesting. But he is not here, so let's not discuss him. Uh, he, he, this is a strange argument. What is the relationship between basic structure, essential features? It's a very important question, no doubt. What is basic structure? I say basic structure is only one. That is judicial review. I always tell my students when uh, uh, explaining Keshwananda that judges, they constitutional striptease. And they shed one garment, I'm a bit sexist, but don't mind it. Uh, the men, men also do striptease anyway, it's a gender neutral term. They took out the shirt, they took out the jacket, they took out the trousers, they took out the mojans, um, everything. One garment they refused to set, shed. Which is that garment? By which they cover their, what we call India, in India we call private park. <laughs> For the end, get this private park, I don't know, for anything different. <laughs> private park. Or if you want to be a little less, a little more vulgar, you say member. I don't know where you got the idea of member. But that is judicial review. That is power to say what the basic system is and what the system features are. Judicial review, I think, is the basic term. The rest of it is public. So you find in Minerva Mills, just Brother Chandrachur going through all the 17 and uh, 24 amendments, saying everything is well, it's not 24, 20, 20, yes, everything is well, or take part. He said, I consider this, I consider this, that's the, the basic. Even if, even if you might say part is basic, the judge is not fit. So that, that. Uh, get it right. What is basic structure? A judicial power, judicial review process and power. Independence of judiciary is an essential feature. The question is quite right whether it unopposed it, whether a collegium. Now why was collegium wrong? According to their lawsuits. Collegium was wrong according to uh, four judges. The amendment was wrong. Because consultation, the article 124 and something else meant consultation with the chief justice, the concurrence of the chief justice of India in this case. <coughs> Paragraph 21 of the judgment clearly, Justice Kerr says, clearly, what a huge paragraph, but he says summary, one point. He says, I ask Attorney General to concede that independence of judiciary is a feature of constitution and we shall not violate it. But he said no. Well, I'll argue the case. I'll argue the case and prove to you that second judge's case, third judge's case is wrongly decided. How will you argue this case? When government of India, and that continues, we are not referring to political regimes. When the government of India in the second judge's case said we have always followed the chapters of India's policy. And out of 400 appointments, a fifth of it, by the secretary law, out of 400 appointments, we have only made, I'm running one at a time, two minutes ago. I, I made only four, four or five appointments, but not contrary to CGI. So, the government accepted it. Third, 
judges case, they came before the Supreme Court in advisory opinion and they said, my Lord, we don't seek a review of the petition. This is not a review petition. It's an advisory opinion. We just want to cross the T's and dot the I's of the second judge's case. We accept the second judge's case. For 20 years, they accepted this, uh, this case. If they want, if they want a review, a review is available. Now, curative is available also. They didn't use any of this procedure. So I don't think, and I'll conclude, I have so many things to say, but it's follow the discussion. And I, also, I cannot read anymore. Uh, the other argument that is made uh, is, yes, so I have no hurts. I, I could not go the argument. I other view, I say better. The judge is appointing judges. Only in India, judges appoint judges. That's the best. Apart from the United States, in most cases, the opinion of the Chief Justice is more or less it is binding in my Lord Chancellor in the in the in, in the UK, but so called mother country, yes? Manmohan's mother country, Manmohan Singh, mother country. So it is there. It's not political, not no political. Limits. I now never make them. So uh, if I make them, correct me. So this is not a judge's appointment. The question is whether the judges should have, the Chief Justice of India should have primacy, primacy and now the collegiate primacy over the president. And the answer of the Supreme Court has always been just since 1990 or so. And second judges case. So these judges don't go by the professors. And they have given instances after instances where judges' time judicial primacy is the settled norm in the countries in which it is said not to be a settled norm. Oh, why do you worry? So, the, it's a political comment that you can make, of course. You are free to make, but political comments are not comments. The observations by busy people made off the cuff. They are not worth a scholarly attention. So this is not worth your, your opposition. Finally, then I would simply add um, the Attorney General, who was very aggressive. The Law Minister was very aggressive. They did not take my considered suggestion at the consideration of juries that they should go for advisory opinion. But they give and take between judges and the executive. They won't hear. I even formulated three questions that the President of India may ask on 18 July. Supreme Court has now converted it to partial advisory opinion. That is, it has said, independence of judiciary, but any difficulty with college, you come and make your suggestion. Now, I'll end with this. So everybody is going to the Supreme Court. Nobody is going to Parliament. Of course, it's not a session that we had reactions on that, but whatever. Parliament can meet a national emergency. If the judgment constitutes a national emergency, then you could have. If the judgment gives Parliament to provide for a judicial commission, don't make a mistake. It does not take a plenary power. It only says you must not touch the independence of judiciary, primacy of the Supreme Court justice. And one judge goes so far as to provide an alternate collegium. I forget his name just now. I think it's Chandrasekhar himself or somebody else. That not the collegium proposed by the act, but collegium that proposed by the court, where all the judges of the Supreme Court will be consulted out of a panel of six of three and named, if they then go to precedent, we never choose one. So, Parliament's power to pass a, a collegium is not affected by this judgment. But the only condition that is put is it should not ask the Supreme Court to overrule the past precedents. A larger bench can, of course, do it and has done it in the past, but only twice in the, in the history of the Supreme Court. The full court has said, but it is not beyond the bounds of imagination. 
So, and the advisory opinion is now being partially uh, uh, undertaken by opening hearings that happened from today. And you tell us what is wrong with Sorajim. Mean, this is my last point. I have to talk too much. Simply, the judges say, are going to say, mark my word, I may not be here in this world, but you check it out. What judges are going to do? I'll tell you now. Judges are going to say, no question of accountability or transparency in appointments. We will mind our own business, you mind yours. But we'll go by certain standards. So the discussion does not give rise to the impression of abuse, not that it's abuse. And citizens of India do not know which is the superior system. A lot has been said about collegium, a lot might be said this evening. It may be right. Chalmeshwar and um, Lokur have said a lot about collegium. They may be right. There is something wrong with collegium. But do we know how Mr. Bharadwaj, the law minister appointed judges? Do we know how successive law minister appointed judges? Did we know how Kumar Mangalam appointed Krishna? Now, of course, you know. So, citizens of India do not know either way. How judges are, certain people are appointed judges, they will never know. They will never know whether it is. So, don't expect anything out of this college I'm hearing, excepting making it a little bit here and there transparent. It's certainly not going to be so transparent as the of information that requires. And political parties know very well that they are not going to follow the Obesity Freedom of Information Act. And they are not going to tell you who your legislators would be and how they are selected. Similarly, you are never going to know as citizens who your judges, how your judges are selected. But there will be some here and there adjustment made in the collegium. And it will be a good thing. Thank you. I have spoken for well, too long. Thank you very much.